Tonight on Talking Politics, Attorney General Maura Healey has been seen as the front runner in the governor's race since even before she officially got in. Another Democrat, former state Senator Ben Downing, dropped out in anticipation of Healey's arrival, saying he just couldn't see a path to victory. And Harvard political theorist Danielle Allen exited after Healey's announcement for the same reason. But a third Democrat, State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz, says she's not going anywhere and that despite Healy's advantages, she can be the party's next nominee and the next governor of Massachusetts. She joins me in a few minutes to talk about her campaign and the state of the race. But first, big changes could be on the horizon for the Boston Public Schools. And it's not just the ongoing search for the city's fifth superintendent in seven years, after Brenda Caselius announced a few weeks ago that she plans to step down in June. There's growing speculation the state could place the long-struggling school district under receivership that would transfer leadership of BPS over to a so-called receiver with broad powers to overhaul the district. It would be the next step in a years-long oversight process by the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, or DESI, which recently ordered a new review of BPS, a possible prelude to a takeover. The idea is being pushed by the Pioneer Institute, which said in a recent study, quote, BPS fails to help most students meet basic standards, and it fails economically disadvantaged students, students of color, English language learners, and students with special needs at higher rates than other students. But Mayor Michelle Wu and the city's teachers union argue that is the wrong way to try to fix the system. Joining me to discuss this and more, Joan Venaki, columnist and associate editor for the Boston Globe, and Yawu Miller, senior editor for the Bay State Banner. Always good to see both of you. Joan, you wrote a column this week arguing against the possibility of a state takeover and calling it an impending act of imperialism. What did you mean by that? Okay, that might be a little bit dramatic. It's, it's not Russia going into Ukraine. But you know, the, the state has full authority to do this. But as a practical matter, it means that the state is coming in and taking away local control, whether or not Boston wants it. And however good the intentions, it's a power play. And in every act like this, there's always a political subtext. In this case, I asked the question, would Governor Baker be doing this if Marty Walsh was still mayor? And there's no way to know for sure, but I just kind of doubt it. Um, the other subtext is the long-time antagonism between the Baker administration, the governor, and the teachers' unions, in this case, the BTU. If there is receivership, uh, the city's contract with teachers could be reworked to some degree, and maybe that's a good thing, and maybe that's what Mayor Wu secretly wants, but that's not what she's saying publicly. Yeah, well, Miller, there are, I believe, three communities currently in state receivership, Southbridge, Holyoke, and Lawrence. Uh, how are those communities faring educationally? Well, they, um, Lawrence has been under receivership for more than 10 years now uh, and remains in the lowest 10% or uh, lowest 6% really of schools um, by the state's own metrics. Um, Southbridge and, um, and Holyoke as well, um, you know, there are all all three districts are categorized as chronically underperforming. I think you state. wrote in the banner that that Southbridge and Holyoke are the bottom two districts in the state. They it's were when, when, yeah, when I wrote about it um, a, a couple years ago, they oh, okay. were in the bottom two. Uh, I'm not sure where they stand now in the state's ranking system. Um, and you know, Laurentians want their schools back uh, at, at the um, board of education hearing or meeting. On Tuesday, uh, you know, one of the school committee members uh, gave us, you know, a, a, a testimony saying that you know, it's not been good for the schools. That you know, I think the majority of the elected officials in Lawrence want this want want local control returned to the schools. In your banner piece on this latest development, you suggest that it's possible the state has a different end game in mind than actual receivership. What other scenarios? do you think the state might be envisioning? Well, one thing people are talking about is uh, a the state could put a cohort of schools into receivership. So um, there are 34 schools in Boston, which are ranked among the lowest uh, 10%, which you know really means essentially that they have the lowest 10% um, in, in as far as students 
uh, scoring on the NCAST exam, so they have the lowest scores. Um, now, there are many reasons for this. I mean, it could be that some of these schools are poorly run. It could be that all the schools are poorly run. It might also be that, you know, Boston, like a lot of other schools that have low income uh, student populations, including Holyoke, you know, Springfield, et cetera, they have, you know, large percentage of students who are low income and they have large percentages of students who are English language learners and students with disabilities. Um, and so in any of those schools that have, you know, a majority or a large percentage of that, you're going to have low MCAS scores. The state could take over a portion of them as they've done in Springfield. They have a Springfield empowerment zone. Um, and uh, that's been operative for uh, quite a few years now. I, I don't know the exact number of years, but I did check into it. Um, and I looked at 14 of the schools. I think there are a total of 17 in the cohort that are in the Springfield empowerment zone. And, you know, those schools are also chronically underperforming. According to the state's own metrics, they're doing, you know, they, I think they're doing worse than the city average of schools. So I don't think that the, that the state, that DESE has had like a, a, a solid track record when it comes to taking over schools. You also there mentioned also, the possibility of the state trying to shape Boston's selection of a new superintendent, right? Absolutely. They, they, um, I mean, that's something that I heard from a number of people saying that that uh, Jeff Riley may be trying to um, weigh in on who the next superintendent should be. Jeff Riley, by the way, for the record, no relation to me. I want to note that as we have this conversation. Uh, Joan, another political subtext that occurred to me while you were talking earlier uh, is the fact that Boston seems like it may be moving toward an elected school committee once again, thereby intensifying local control, direct accountability to voters. And this would pull in the opposite direction if it came to pass. Having said that, I want to ask you about the findings from the last state review of BPS back in 2019, because they were pretty scathing. The findings were from a district review report conducted by the state that in Boston, Access to high quality teaching is not assured. Improvements in academic outcomes are largely stalled. And many schools have major deficiencies in their facilities. Also, across the district, significant racial and economic disparities persist. So Joan, I can imagine someone watching at home, maybe even a BPS parent watching at home and saying, okay, it's interesting to ponder whether Baker would have done this with Marty Walsh in office, but the fact remains, the status quo in BPS right now is really bad, and Charlie Baker is still governor. Uh, we want to see action, or the state should take action. What would your response be if anyone's making that objection? Well, first, I'd say you're absolutely right. Charlie Baker is still governor and will be governor until January 2023, right? But the timing still feels off to me. Boston has a new mayor, one who ran and identified very heavily as a BPS mom said she was invested in changing the schools and changing the direction of the schools. Um, she won by a large mar margin. I think she has the right to try to implement the vision that she has, which presumes that she has a vision. We haven't really seen that. And she, I don't think, supports a full elected school committee. So, you know, that's, right. that's a little wrench, a little wrench in the whole thing. Um, Another thing that I would just throw out about the timing, and I think um, this was raised in the Bay State Banner piece, we've just come through two years of COVID, which had a extremely you know, tough impact on school kids across the state of Massachusetts. I don't know how fair it really is to go in right now and, and audit the Boston public schools and find out how they've you know, manage how they've weathered those those two years. That's a good point. Now, there are two sides to the argument. You know, I went to law school, so I know that. On one hand, you could say this is the time to go in, you know, when think they've reached a low point, they've had, you know, why not, you know, have the state go in and, and sort of have this turnaround. But the city was making progress. Even Commissioner Riley has acknowledged that the city was making progress. So why not, again, let Mayor Wu pick a new superintendent, move the schools forward, if that's what she wants to do. Wants to do. And also... There's just no proof in the track record that receivership will do what they're promising. It, it's no miracle. Let's move on to a sort of, I guess, de facto lightning round. I want to talk about a couple other subjects before we wrap up here. Yahoo, uh, Jeff Deal, the Republican candidate for governor, picked a new running mate this week. He tapped Leah Allen, who was known as Leah Cole back when she was a state representative. What's your take on her pick? 
Um, I mean, I think one of the major issues that 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 you pointed out in your piece that you know that kind of driving her politically is uh, vaccination mask mandate. Like that, you know, she lost her job because she refused to be vaccinated. Or is, uh, right on the verge, she says. Yeah. Right on the verge. Right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think that that. I don't see that as a as a as a good wedge issue for Republicans. I, I I think that the majority of Massachusetts people in polling have expressed support for vaccinations and they intended to be vaccinated and have been vaccinated. Um, I don't see her getting a lot of traction in her well, demonstrations we're... about vaccines, but in vaccine mandate. But small group of people, yeah. a small vocal group of people. I don't know that this is going to set the electorate on fire. I should mention, as I go to you here, Joan, that Leah Allen said her reluctance, uh, at least initially, about getting vaccinated stemmed from the fact that she was pregnant, and she didn't think the results on pregnant women, possible side effects, have been sufficiently studied. What do you think of the pick? I mean, now Jeff Deal has a running mate. Chris Doty, his opponent in the governor's primary on the GOP side, also has a running mate, former state rep Kate Campanelli. Do you think the Allen pick will help Deal uh, emerge as the nominee? Well, I look at it and see that Jeff Deal is doubling down. Um, this, you know, his pick for lieutenant governor is pro-Trump. She thinks the election was rigged and, and stolen, and she is anti, you know, basically anti-vaccination. Um, for anyone who thinks that the road to the governor's office in Massachusetts is down the middle, Deal is saying no. You know, he doesn't see it that way. Um, so I think it's interesting, it will be interesting to find out if he and Jim Lyons, the head of the state Republican Party, know something that we don't know. Um, it is true that Maura Healy seems to be doing everything she can right now to avoid being labeled, you know, super left or super mm -hmm. progressive. So, you know, maybe there's some dynamic going on. And as far as, you know, vaccination mandates, well, they may be on to something. I know polling has showed that Massachusetts generally supports it. And I think the last poll was right during the Omicron surge, which we were all, I think, really, you know, all sort of influenced the thinking at the time. Um, even progressive mayors like Wu are, are backing away a little bit from vaccine mandates. So, you know, who knows how it breaks down. I should note that when uh, Leah Allen was asked about the 26, pardon me, the 2020 election and whether it had been stolen from President Trump, she didn't say outright yes. She said that she thought big concerns had been raised and that there was still more information that needed to come in. But your point about him doubling down, I think, is well taken. Joan Vanaki and Yahoo Miller, we got to leave it there. Thanks to both of you. Next up, there are just a few months to go until the Massachusetts Democratic Party convention when delegates will decide who's going to be on the primary ballot this fall and which candidates won't make the cut. So far, the last Democrat to jump into the race for governor, Attorney General Maura Healey, seems to be in a strong position financially and in the polls. Back in January, a survey by the Mass Inc. polling group showed her with 48 percent support compared to 12 percent for state Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz and 3 percent for Harvard political theorist Danielle Allen, who's since left the race. But there hasn't been much polling since then. And recently, Chang-Diaz has made it clear she's in the campaign for the long haul via a campaign memo to supporters that said she has a clear and credible path to victory in the primary and beyond. She joins me now to talk about how she plans to win. Senator, thank you for being here. Adam, thanks for having me. So as you know much better than me, the Democratic Party caucuses just wrapped up. How did that process go for you and your campaign? You know, I don't have to say it was um, it was fun. It was really nice. Uh, you know, many of the caucuses happened over Zoom, but many of them happened in person. It was really great um, to be out and get to be, you know, in real life uh, with so many folks. And, um, you know, what I heard uh, over and over again uh, from delegates, you know, from attendees at the caucuses was how much uh, folks are looking forward to debate in every sense of the word, right? And really, you know, a lot of questions about the issues, you know, where do you stand on this, Sonia? What's your plan for that, Sonia? Is there gonna be a debate? Uh, and so it was a really exciting kickoff to this sort of like central, you know, uh, section of the campaign season that we are in right now. We'll get to the debate question in just a little bit, but coming out of the caucuses, are you confident that you have the support of at least 15% of delegates so that you can make it onto the primary ballot? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sounds like from from your answer, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. It sounds like it's not close in your mind. You, you're confident that you've got that by a good margin. 
You know, Adam, we've been out campaigning for eight months, right? We've been laying down great tracks and we have been putting together an incredible coalition all across this state, right? We've got of over 80 uh, endorsers all across this state, state and local elected officials, uh, racial justice leaders, community leaders, and we're seeing that bear out in the caucuses as well. We know that the vast majority of delegates are actually undecided. Uh, in this race, and that's great. You know, we're, I'm, I'm here to show up and be accountable and let folks kick, kick the tires. Um, but no, I feel really strong coming out of caucuses. In that state of the race memo I mentioned uh, a moment ago, your campaign outlined several areas where you believe it's going to work to your advantage to contrast your record and your approach to the attorney generals. There's probably more areas than we can get to in depth here. So if you could pick maybe the two areas you think are most important and mm -hmm. talk through what you believe the contrast between you and the AG are, that'd be terrific. Sure, sure thing. Um, and you're right, there are multiple differences, right? There's differences between us on health care policy. I'm the only candidate that supports single-payer health care. There are differences on environmental uh, issues on um, climate action, on education. I'll give you a specific example on education policy. Um, folks may remember the Student Opportunity Act, right? This is a generational uh, scale reform in the way that we fund public education, K-12 public education. In 2019, when the debate was really intense uh, over this legislation, and there were actually two or three uh, proposals kicking around on Beacon Hill uh, that we were grappling with, and there was a billion dollar difference uh, between the proposal that I wrote, the bill that I wrote, and was backed by the Promise Act Coalition, uh, and the other two bills uh, that were being considered before the legislature. Um, I put, you know, my political capital on the line uh, for the bill that will go the full distance and really be that game changer for low-income communities and communities of color. The attorney general was not willing to do that, right? All she was willing to do was send a letter, uh, you know, a broadly worded letter to the committee that expressed support for the already consensus uh, sort of you know, abstract principles, um, but not you know, put that political capital on the line for that billion dollar difference. Uh, and that was, you know, that's a difference when I'm out there on the campaign trail now, thank goodness we won it, right? We built an incredible coalition uh, of stakeholders across the state to push Beacon Hill to pay attention to that difference uh, and follow through. Uh, and now when I'm out on the campaign trail and I'm talking to, you know, school leaders across the state and I'm asking them about the Student Opportunity Act, which was the final name of the bill, um, and they're seeing the first dollars flow. Uh, and I'm asking them, what are you spending your first Student Opportunity Act dollars? And almost every one of them has said social emotional wraparound services, increasing those in schools. And so, you know, that billion dollar difference between those two packages that's real stuff in real kids' lives right now, right? Maybe the difference between a social worker or a school psychologist and not uh, having one. And that's what it means to not just speak in platitudes, right, and sound bites, but to really show up when the chips are down uh, and when communities that have been suffering under the status quo for so long really need you, right? And that's that's why this election is so important because there are real differences between us and our and differences in willingness to stand on the line when it's important. I've read the letter that you're talking about and my recollection squares with your description that it was a statement of support for uh, a range of possible proposals that had not yet been decided on. I've also seen tweets from the AG after that legislation finally passed, the Student Opportunity Act, in which she seemed to cheer the passage of it. Is it fair mm -hmm. to say from your vantage point that she was supportive of the end result, even if she wasn't as involved earlier on as you would have liked her to be? Well, so Adam, I think that, you know, that's, that's a key difference, right, is that it takes uh, grit and it takes a willingness to come off the sidelines and engage in those difficult, uncomfortable, politically inconvenient moments in order to get the win, right? And once it's won, you know, everybody likes to express support, right? Success has many mothers, uh, as the expression goes. Um, but our next governor is going to need to be someone who is willing to get in there and do the tough work on behalf of families across Massachusetts, even when it's politically uncomfortable, even when victory is not assured, right? Because that is how we're going to get real substantial change on things like our you know, fastest growing student debt load in the nation here in Massachusetts. And the fact that people are sitting in, you know, soul crushing commutes across our Commonwealth. These are not easy things to change. Before, uh, have them. oh, I apologize for stepping on you there. Before we turn to your call this week for three debates prior to the convention with the AG, just briefly, another area that 
your campaign flagged in the memo that I mentioned earlier was racial justice. Briefly, it's an enormous topic to tackle briefly, yeah. but what do you see as the big contrast between or contrast between you and the AG there? So here again, Adam, I'll say um, I think the biggest contrast is in willingness to come off the sidelines, you know, when the moment um, is difficult and when it's challenging, or even or maybe when no one's looking, right? Um, and I'll give you a, here again a specific example. Uh, last year, I got it included into the budget um, language to establish an oversight office over our Department of Corrections and require um, at the height of the pandemic that they engage in decarceration work to reduce overcrowding in our prisons at a time when it was enormously dangerous, right, to be in the tinderbox of a prison. We actually gave the ball um, to the attorney general in that language um, and gave her the power to appoint uh, the person who was going to head up that independent oversight office so that it would be truly independent. Um, the attorney general uh, made a recommendation to the DOC about who that person should be. They promptly ignored it uh, and picked, handpicked their own person to be, you know, their overseer. And the attorney general, you know, refused to assert uh, her authority and her responsibility to make that independent appointment. And, you know, she talks a lot of, the attorney general talks a lot about being a point guard, right? Um, she had the ball, she had the shot, and she didn't take it. Instead, she put the ball down and walked off the court. That's the difference between the kind of leadership that I've shown on criminal justice and racial justice issues and what it means to actually deliver uh, for families who have been waiting for justice in these systems for so long. You sent a letter to the AG this week saying that you want three debates prior to the convention, uh, in-person, live debates. Uh, her response, her campaign's response, I want to quote it here in its entirety. Uh, her spokesperson, Carissa Hand, said yesterday, since launching her campaign two months ago, Moore has been traveling the state, participating in dozens of caucuses and candidate forums. She's been talking directly with delegates and voters to hear from them and answer their questions. She looks forward to continuing to engage with voters throughout this campaign and participating in forums and debates before the primary election to share her vision and ensure voters know where the candidates stand on the issues. What's your response to that response? Adam, I think that that response, uh, you know, I don't see any specific commitments in there. Uh, and I think it actually echoes uh, the frustration that, that I'm hearing from voters about the absence of specific commitments from the attorney general on a lot of things, right? I'm the only candidate in this race that has an issues page. Uh, up on her website, right? Who has uh, filled out questionnaires for several of the groups that have put forth questionnaires. I've been on a lot of candidate forums already in this race, including uh, forums, you know, that were head to head with the, the other candidates that were previously in this race. I've sat, you know, next to multiple empty chairs or empty Zoom tiles uh, in, in that time. Uh, and I think that we, you know, we need to call on every candidate in this race um, to make specific commitments, both in policy and in willingness to stand up and be accountable to the voters by engaging in debate. This election is going to be indirectly something of a referendum on Charlie Baker's stewardship of the state over the past uh, eight years. I want to show you a clip of Maura Healy talking with Jim Browdy on Greater Boston about her assessment of the governor and then get yours. But first, let's hear from the AG. I think in many respects, Governor Baker has done a really excellent job in stewarding our state. And I, I will tell you that there have been times where he and I have not agreed on everything. We've had some different philosophies about things. But, you know, he always brought to the table and brought to the game an earnestness and a commitment to trying to do the right thing to help people here. And I think that's what we ask of those who serve in government. All right. So there's more Healy on Governor Baker. I'd like to get Sonia Cheng Diaz on Governor Baker. So Adam, I, I also, you know, I want to salute uh, Governor Baker. I think that he has, you know, given many years of his life in service to this Commonwealth. And I think that is always worth saluting. Um, I also have um, disagreed with Governor Baker's uh, positions and his uh, priorities and his lack of priorities in some cases um, over his time in office. And I haven't been afraid to stand up and say that. Um, you know, the example that I gave you earlier about education, right, one of those three proposals that, um, that was on the table uh, was Governor Baker's proposal, right, and it offered maybe at most two, three hundred million dollars uh, in, in annual investment in our schools compared to over a billion dollars. And at that moment, you know, that was the distinction that the attorney general, she disagreed with the governor, was not willing to stand up and say it. 
Um, the same has been true on criminal justice reform, right? For many years, uh, leaders in our legislature, both the governor uh, and leaders in our, our democratically held legislature made promises to communities of color about engaging in true comprehensive criminal justice reform. I was willing to stand up and you know, put my political capital out there and take risks that you know, involved blowback uh, and political costs for me uh, to stand up and say, it's too much delay, it's too much waiting. We owe it to people to follow through on our promises for comprehensive criminal justice reform. And that was a turning point in the debate that actually ended up getting us a comprehensive bill. I did not hear the attorney general stand up and give voice to her, her disagreements uh, with the governor if she had them at that moment. I'd love to get your take before we wrap up here. We've only got about a minute and a half left. On the prospect of state receivership for the Boston public school system, you obviously are a legislator from Boston. What do you make of the state's push to if I understand correctly, more quickly than usual, explore the possibility of receivership and maybe implement it before Governor Baker leaves office? Adam, I think the state has a lot of questions to answer for itself um, before it goes about uh, pursuing new districts to bring into receivership. There are a lot of open and unanswered questions about how successful the state has been as an overseer and as an administrator of um, districts that have been struggling, and that's a question we need to answer first. Okay, we actually have time for one more question, which I want to run by you. I was hoping to, to get to ask it. I thought we might not get to it. I'm curious about what, how important you believe it should be to voters that you were in the governor's race when it wasn't clear if Governor Baker was going to seek a third term, and the AG jumped in after he announced that he would not. How do you want Democratic primary voters to think through that contrast? I, you know, thank you for raising that question, Adam. I'm glad we had time for it because I do think it's an important data point. Um, our next governor is going to need to have the courage of her convictions. Um, undoing the status quo and so many of the weights that working families have been carrying for too long, right? Healthcare costs, childcare costs, a cavernous wealth divide in our state, the consequences of climate change. These things are going to require grit and courage uh, in order to truly tackle them and put results into the end zone. Um, I was not afraid to get into this race when Charlie Baker was, you know, pr presumably or potentially still going to be in it because I know how urgent this moment is uh, and how urgently we need culture change on Beacon Hill in order to drive that kind of transformational change. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a pattern. Okay. We got to leave it there. State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz, thank you for making time to be here. Thank you, Adam. That's going to do it for tonight, but do come back next week and please keep sending your thoughts. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics, or you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Riley Adam. For now, thank you for watching and good night.